Good morning, church. You can turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. I'm going to start reading here in verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Now he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father God, you are incredible. You are awesome. Like we were just singing, God, you were worthy of all the praise we were just giving you, God. And we thank you for the chance and the opportunity not only to be in your presence, God, but the opportunity to be with each other, the opportunity to enjoy this fellowship, to enjoy your church, to know you and your kingdom, God. Those are such wonderful things. And I pray that this morning we can take advantage of this opportunity. God, that you can move me aside and allow your word and your spirit to impact the hearts in this room, God. Encourage us, convict us, inspire us, God. Help us to know you better and help us to become more like you. In your son Jesus' name, we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 Welcome. Thank you so much for being here this morning, especially if you are visiting with us. My prayer is that it's not just a visit, that you will come, that you will enjoy what you experience here, that the word will move you, that the spirit will capture you, and that you will decide at some point to become a part of this church family. Because here's the deal. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. There are Millions of people out in the wor world who are without God and without hope. And for the church, there is a lot of work to be done. And God invites us in to this wonderful mission of changing the world. We're going to talk all about that today. But I'll tell you what, we pray often to the Lord of the harvest for more workers in the harvest field. So as I'm inviting you in and as I'm saying, hey, come be a part of the church family, I'm not saying come and worship with us on a Sunday morning, though please come and worship with us on a Sunday morning. I'm inviting you in to the life of this church, to the mission of this church, and to the purpose of the kingdom of God. And if you're interested in that, please talk to the person who invited you. Uh, we have these fantastic core value studies that will teach you all about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be a member here. Amen. Uh, this week, we're starting a new series called Fishers of Men. Now, this whole year, we've been teaching through what it means to be a true disciple. Uh, I feel like that's important. Because there are a lot of ideas in the world, especially in the Western world, of what it means to be a Christian. And I felt, we felt, as a leadership team, that it was necessary to really talk about what true discipleship looks like. Because in the world around us, there's a lot of false discipleship. There's a lot of poor Christianity. There's a lot of bad examples. But we as a church and as followers of Jesus, we want to be people who are genuine. We want to be people who actually look like 
what the scriptures describe. So we've been teaching all through what it means to be a true disciple. And as we continue to explore the community seat of our mission, and if that's new to you, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, our mission statement here is very, very simple. Communion, that we want to be people who are close and intimate with God. Character, that we want to be people whose characters are transformed because of our intimacy with God to be in the likeness of Jesus. And once we become more like Jesus, the third C is community that we take the kingdom of God to the communities around us. So the last leg of this year, uh, from now until the end of the year, all of our sermons are focused on this community C of our mission. And we're entering today into a series uh, that we all know disciples need to do and to be, okay? This idea of being fishers of men. But uh, let's be honest, for, for some of us, the concept of being a fisher of men is one of the harder commandments. Now, I've said this before, but I don't know what is more difficult. The character C, which calls us to reform our characters and become people who actually not just behave like Jesus, but really think like Jesus. We want to become people that feel like Jesus. That when we see something in the world, like that our spirit responds like Jesus' spirit would respond. When we talk about our characters being changed, we're talking about down to the deepest parts of ourselves. I think that's difficult. I think that's not necessarily an easy process. Now, the beautiful part of it all is that we get this amazing gift called the Holy Spirit at baptism which means it is not on our own strength that we change our characters. But we can allow the Holy Spirit to make us into people who actually live like Jesus. That's why that community, sorry, that communion see is important because if we're not intimate and close with the Holy Spirit and with the presence of God, we won't allow that power to actually transform us but we really start bucking back. Like, I don't think that intimacy part is hard. Like, it's not actually hard to read your Bible. We're just lazy, right? It's not actually hard to pray. We're just lazy, right? Or we're, quote unquote, too busy, right? I love that excuse because like, maybe some of you are, but for me, I'm never too busy to eat food. Actually, even when I'm busy, I find time to get snacks because it makes the busyness more bearable, all right? But for some reason, you know, physical sustenance, we love partaking in. But spiritual sustenance, for some reason, becomes a chore. But that first C, that intimacy, I just, I don't put it on the, it's not on the difficult scale. It's just we have to, have to actually be disciplined in how we live our lives. But this character C, let's be honest, that's difficult. To look your sinful nature in the face and say, no, you don't rule me today. I'm not going to do the things that I've always done, even though these patterns and these habits can be deeply ingrained in who we are and how we react to the world. That is a difficult thing to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit and allow him to change who we are. But I don't know what is more difficult, that character C or this community C, right? Which calls us to look beyond ourselves and spread the kingdom to the community around us through service and evangelism. Now, that character C is hard, but at the, end of the get, at the end of the day, guess what? We still get to focus on ourselves, right? There is much benefit. This is why Christianity often gets uh, falsely seen as like a self-help program, because here's the deal. If you draw near to Jesus and become more like him, you will see much blessings in your life, many blessings in your life. You becoming more like Jesus is going to make your life better and the life better of everybody who encounters you, okay? So there is much benefit that we get to becoming more like Jesus, even though it's difficult, right? It is as difficult as like going to the gym or eating healthy. When you actually have the discipline to do it, you see gains, amen? It's the same spiritually. In your character, you want to see spiritual gains. But this third C, this community C, it is difficult because it calls us to be selfless. 
We all love to sit and to navel gaze and to spend time thinking about ourselves. We like sitting in that spiritual space where it's all about us. You know, how can I grow? What am I working on? You know, you know, where am I going to go today? What's my goals? Look, we grow truly and maturely. And we talked about this the last few weeks, but we grow by getting outside of ourselves. I don't know which one is more difficult, changing our own character or being selfless people who turn our attention to helping others. And you know, the primary way that we want to spread the kingdom is through two things. One is through service, community service, loving people, giving to people, helping people, right? Uh, and the second is through evangelism, actually teaching people about Jesus and actually teaching people to live like Jesus. And I think truthfully, most of us don't mind the service part because Secretly, we can still glorify ourselves in that aspect. You realize nobody in the world is going to point at people who do community service and say, hey, those are horrible people. Nobody's going to point at a group who goes and loves people and gives to people as they have need and think that is a weird cult. Nobody's going to think that. The entire world gives you a thumbs up when you go do charity work. That's why still that part's not that difficult. Again, if we can just get beyond our own selfishness and get out there, we can start looking good to people. People will think we're awesome. It's this next part that really I think we all struggle with. It's the evangelism part, right? The making disciples part. That's where it gets weird. Where we start to tell people like, hey, actually, Jesus is the only way to go. When we start to say, hey, look, do you have a church? Do you want to come out to church? That's when people start getting a little iffy. Why do you got to invite me to church? Why do you got to open the Bible with me? Why do you need to talk to me about your religion? That's where we all start getting weird. Uh, now, this specific sermon, it flows out of uh, two things. Uh, the first is earlier in the year, we did a sermon series called Follow Me. The third sermon in that series was called Go and Make. And in truth, this sermon is a bit of a spiritual uh, sequel to that sermon. So if you have time, uh, I do think that these two sermons that uh, Follow Me, Part 3, Go and Make, and this sermon fit very well together. And also, this sermon is flowing right out of the house church sermons that we just completed to weeks ago. So honestly, those four lessons are, are great foundations that uh, flow right into what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, they, they all go into this concept of being uh, fishers of men. And I also want to mention that as we shift into the rest of the sermons this year, uh, they will have a dual purpose, okay? Uh, the first purpose is to call each of us as disciples and as Christians higher, and to teach us how to have the right heart and attitude as we take the kingdom to the communities around us. That's the first purpose, to teach us, to call us higher, to equip us. The second purpose is to help us understand as we teach others what it looks like and what it means to be disciple makers. This is very important because I think a lot of us and not even us, like people in general, we think of Christianity just as like we have to be good people. We have to stop doing our old sins. The truth is you cannot be a disciple of Jesus without being a disciple maker. You cannot be a disciple. There's no such thing as, well, I'm just going to reform my life and behave better. And that's what it means to be a Christian. That, that's the, the when, when Jesus calls his disciples, well, let's get into that. The title of today's sermon is Fishers of Men, Part One. Be the good news. Be the good news. So in Mark 1, you don't necessarily have to turn there. I'm going to I'm going to summarize it. But in Mark 1, Jesus begins his ministry. And he's going around and he's preaching the good news. And the good news it describes Jesus is preaching something very simple and very specific. Jesus is preaching that the kingdom of heaven is near. Therefore, repent 
and believe this message. The kingdom of heaven, of heaven is near. Remember, he's talking to Jewish people, Jewish people who had lost their kingdom and it had been lost for, for centuries, over 500 years. And the Jews had been waiting around for this kingdom to be restored to them. And they'd been waiting around for the prophet, the king, the Messiah, the Christ to come to overthrow Rome and to give them their kingdom back. That's what the Jews are waiting for. So Jesus comes on the scene and he starts preaching what is known as the gospel. And I want to make this very clear because somehow at some point in the history of America, the gospel got watered down to one specific moment. But if you ask most people, hey, what is the gospel? They're going to tell you, well, it's the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we might have a chance to go to heaven. And while that statement is true, it's not complete. When Jesus comes and he preaches the gospel, what he doesn't preach in Mark 1 is, hey guys, I'm about to die for your sins so you can go to heaven. That's not what he says in Mark 1. What does he say? He says, the kingdom of heaven is coming to you. Get ready for it. Change the way you think and the way you live so that you can be a part of this kingdom. That's, that's the good news he's preaching. And it is true that the cross is the climax of that good news. That without Jesus' sacrifice, we would not have the chance, the power, or the opportunity to become the people that Jesus is transforming us into. But it's just a moment in the gospel. The whole gospel is about the kingdom coming. And so Jesus is preaching this good news, right? Uh, and then right after he starts preaching the good news, what's the very next thing that Jesus does? Well, he goes and he recruits a team. It says he goes to a few fishermen, to uh, Peter and his brother Andrew, and then later uh, John, uh, James and his brother John, right? Both two groups of fishermen. He goes and he recruits them. And when he calls them, and he tells them two things. He says, hey, come follow me. And I will transform you into fishers of men. Now, I want to stop and go back for a second. I want to highlight something about Jesus. Jesus is all powerful. Okay? Which means he could have come up with any method in creation or in the universe to spread his kingdom over the earth. Jesus did not need to build a team to help him. But we see this as the character of God, even from the beginning. God makes creation, and then the crown of his creation is human beings. From the beginning, he wanted this partnership with us. From the beginning, though God could have reigned all on his own, he creates us and he says, look, I want to be with you all. I want to share this relationship with you all. And I want us to do this job together of taking care of all of creation. That was his mindset from the beginning. So when Jesus comes to restore the kingdom that was lost in Genesis, he says the same thing. I don't need you guys. I am the king and I am all powerful. But one, the truth is, Jesus is like, I'm only physically going to be here for three years. And the system that I set up, the structure I set up is going to be based on the idea of you guys are going to need each other. This church and this kingdom will be relationally focused and it will be driven by the bonds, the connections, and the love of the brothers and sisters in Christ. So Jesus calls these men to himself. He builds a team and he builds an entourage. And, 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 and I want to say this, and I think this is very important, because there are some things in Scripture where you read and sometimes they apply to us and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the context is that he's talking to specific people here and he's talking to specific people there. But when it comes to this invitation, this is a timeless invitation. That he reaches out to these four men who already have a job and they're good at their job and they're doing their job every single day. And he says, I want to 
transform your purpose in this world. And I want to invite you into this mission and into this adventure that I'm about to embark on that's going to take my eternal kingdom to the ends of the earth. Jesus called those first disciples, but guess what? He's calling you as well. And I don't know where you are this morning. Some of you answered the call 20, 30, 40 years ago, and we are extremely grateful for your example. Many of us are here because of your example, because you took the mission seriously, because you've been preaching the word and living out the gospel for decades. Many of you baptized many of us. That's how the church grows. Some of us, maybe we answered the call just a few years ago, and I want to encourage you, continue to grow in your faith. Continue to allow the spirit to transform who you are. Don't let your character and quote unquote personality stop you from fulfilling the mission that Jesus has invited you into. Humble yourself to the guidance of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. But some of us, some of us haven't answered the call yet. And there could be any number of reasons why you haven't answered the call. But I want to encourage you this morning. It's the best decision you can ever make in your life. And it does not come without sacrifice. It does not come without hardship. But what you gain when you answer this call, it's better than anything else that you can have in this world. It's literally the greatest treasure. So Jesus is preaching this gospel and that really, uh, it says he's preaching the good news. That's literally what evangelism means. It means to bring the good news. The word gospel is also derived from this Greek. It's all about bringing the good news of the kingdom. So then he invites these fishermen in and uh, I've summarized discipleship in this one scripture, okay? If, if you want a boiled down version of what discipleship is, discipleship is very simply doing two things, living like Jesus and teaching other people to live like Jesus. Discipleship is following Jesus and being a fisher of men, helping other people follow Jesus. This is why I said at the beginning, you cannot be a disciple without being a disciple maker. Discipleship doesn't end with just behaving correctly. If that was the case, Jesus would say, hey, come follow me. And he would stop there. There wouldn't be that second part. But as he defines this new role that he's giving these men, he says there's two parts to it. Live like me and help others to live like me. This means that the church isn't just a place where we worship God. It's not just a place where we draw near to him and become more like him, but the church is an active, offensive force against the darkness and hopelessness that exists out there in the world. And church, this is something we have to understand. The world is dark and hopeless. I checked Facebook this morning. It was like 6.45. I was in there drinking my coffee, right? Um, and uh, a friend of mine from high school, their Facebook status was super simple. It just said, I'm tired of life. And I'm like, why did you wake up in the morning? And that was your first thought, right? God designed life to be something that was vibrant, beautiful, amazing. Life should be something that is good. And yet most people feel the opposite. Most people feel the weight of life. They feel the tragedy of life. They feel the strife of life, the anxiety of life. Most people are out here, not necessarily wishing to die, but wishing that the gravity of it all was just a little bit easier. Most people are without hope and without God. And this is something that we have to understand that when we find the kingdom, when we, when we embrace Jesus and his invitation, it's not just a self-help program. 
It's more than just you being reformed, that Jesus invites us into something that is actively working against the strife, the tragedy, the anxiety, the hardship. We cannot hold on to this treasure for ourselves. It's not about finding it and, and hiding it under a bushel, just like we sang about. It's about letting the light shine so that other people can find the same relief, the same goodness, the same peace and shalom as Ryan talked about, the same wholeness that we have been given. I'm gonna spend the next three weeks talking about the power and the necessity of evangelism so that we all understand that Jesus is calling every true disciple to be a fisher of men. Jesus is calling every true disciple to be a fisher of men. My only point this morning, and one of the most fundamental principles that need, that needs to be a cornerstone of our evangelism is this. If we want to share the good news, we have to first be the good news. Evangelism starts here. If we want to share the good news, we have to first be the good news. Now here's the deal. This is not a new concept. You've heard it before, right? Practice what you preach. Or St. Francis of Assisi famously said, preach the gospel. And when necessary, use words. <laughs> Another popular phrase that has the same spirit in a more negative light, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. You know, Jesus called out the religious leaders time and time again for being hypocrites. They were supposed to be representatives of God. They were supposed to show the world who God was and they claimed to be doing that. Like I know when we read the Bible and we read about the Pharisees and Sadducees, they look like such villains, right? We read and we're like, these guys were awful. These guys were terrible. They're out here doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But the truth is, if you were to go back in time and you were to pull a Pharisee aside and say, hey, are you the villain in the story? They would not be like, yeah, yeah, yeah like I, I wake up every morning really trying to not do what God told me to do. They wouldn't admit that. These are people who had grown so confident in their own spirituality, so confident in their own Bible knowledge that they didn't realize that they were being hypocrites. These men claimed to actually be the representatives of God and his kingdom. You know, I think maybe somewhere deep down, if they were really honest with themselves, they might have understood that what they were doing was to their own glory, maybe deep down. But a lot of people, you know, we don't like to go deep down. It's the same with us. That There are some sins, some thoughts, some attitudes that we may, we, we may know they're there. But the kind of work it takes to really get down in there, we're just not willing to dig deep. And so what happens is we allow these blind spots in our lives and we lie to ourselves day in and day out to bury them deeper. And these blind spots, what they do is they make us ineffective and unproductive. And then we keep doing the quote unquote spiritual things and it creates this really weird balance to where we're growing more and more confident in our quote unquote spirituality. All the while we're allowing certain sins to sink deeper and deeper, deeper and make us rotten on the inside. This is how hypocrites are born. Nobody wakes up in the morning ready to be a villain. Nobody wakes up in the morning ready to admit that they're actually not following Jesus today. In fact, we use following Jesus as a shield to make ourselves feel better about our own lives. This is a huge thing that's happening in society nowadays, virtue signaling. We will be damned before we look like the bad guys. We will not let ourselves be the villain. 
And so we uplift ourselves, we uphold ourselves where our blind spots make us rotten to the core. You know, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they claimed and preached a glory that they were not willing to live. They claimed and they preached a glory that they were not willing to live. That hard work that I'm talking about, that getting deep, that actually pulling out all the muck and the mire and the gunk within us, that, that hurts. It does not feel good. It takes us having other people in our lives, inviting them in, having them tell us where we are sinful and where we are wrong. And here's the deal, a lot of us hate that. And what we start to do is we get defensive and we start pointing out their sins because we care more about looking like the good guy. That work is difficult and some of us aren't willing to get down and dirty like that. Whereas Jesus, right, his whole example is that he, he surrenders himself, not only to being defamed and called out and, and told that he was sinful, he wasn't even sinful, but even when they brought it against him, he didn't defend himself. But then they made it physical. And even then he didn't fight back. He allowed himself to be destroyed so that all of us could be redeemed. But many of us aren't willing to even die to ourselves so that we can know redemption. This is something we have to think about. We have to be honest with ourselves. The Pharisees and Sadducees claimed and preached the glory that they were not willing to live. Are you willing to live the very glory and goodness that Jesus lived? and preached and exemplified. You know, many of us, we have evangelism backwards. When we think of sharing our faith, that's when we get scared, right? We get spooked, we get anxious over the idea of having to open our mouths, having to meet and invite a stranger to something. We get annoyed that we have to deny ourselves even when we don't feel like it. And we get annoyed when we have to spend time making new friends and building new relationships. And maybe that's not all of us, but it certainly is me. I'm an introvert. I like myself and I don't like most other people. And yeah, I don't really want to spend time with you guys. Now look, I'm speaking from my sinful nature, all right? Let me be honest here. And, and, and you know, this is me getting deep and dirty, getting the muck and mire out, okay? I'm an introvert and people are difficult. People are difficult because hanging out with people, especially in the Christian context, building relationships, that all, that's not all just fun and games. It's not rainbows and sunshine. It's not like every time I'm hanging out with people, it's just fun goodness. No, we all struggling. Then we have to carry each other's weight, carry each other's burdens. We got to call out people's sins and have people call out our sins. Look, <laughs> like I said, the work is hard and don't none of us want to do it. Or maybe some of you do. I don't. Not in my sinful nature. Not, not normally, right? When it's left to my flesh. But we get so anxious and so spooked about really taking care of other people, really preaching the gospel. We get afraid of the teaching part of the ministry. We get afraid of the preaching part of the ministry. And oftentimes we leave those things to the quote unquote minister, forgetting that we're all ministers of reconciliation. We get so afraid, you know, that, that, that old adage that uh, someone would rather be in the grave than, uh, than preach the eulogy. That's how afraid we are of just really opening our mouths and having people look at us and maybe uh, looking weird because we're talking about Jesus. We get so worried about these things. We get so stressed about invites. But we don't think really much at all about our own personal spiritual integrity. We don't feel the same kind of anxiety when it comes to us being the kinds of people that we need to be. We're so afraid of having to stand up and open our mouths, but when it comes to overcoming purity, why? Well, I'm just not gonna think too deeply about that. I don't feel the same kind of push, the same kind of fight, the same kind of conviction. It's hard to have spiritual integrity. The problem is when we all play that game, you know, uh, we might go out there and we might invite people out. But if, if we are not people who are actually first following Jesus, then what we end up doing is we end up inviting people to a church of hypocrites. 
And inviting people to a church full of hypocrites, what it does is it empties evangelism of its power because by our lives, what we tell people is that there is actually no good news. Right? It's easy for Christians to be people who sing praises about Jesus' victory on the cross, but then live like the Messiah never showed up in the first place. When Jesus called his first disciples, the prerequisite to making disciples was first following him. That's the prerequisite. He didn't come on the scene and say, be a fisher of men. He came on the scene and first, first, he said, follow me. Sharing the good news, it starts with being the good news. So what does that mean? Go to Luke chapter four. We started here. We're gonna flesh this out real quick. Luke four, verse 14. I'm gonna hop right in. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread to the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He stood to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's an awesome mic drop moment. Jesus is incredible. And this scripture is so powerful to me because Jesus is making a massive statement about who he is and what he has come to do. For one, on a very basic reading of the scripture, this is what happens. Jesus reads the Bible and then he says, I have come to do this. Actually, quite literally, what he says is today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the embodiment of this scripture. I am this scripture come to life. John describes it by calling Jesus the word of God. That everything Jesus did and everything Jesus said came right from the Old Testament. God had prophesied it before. He was the Old Testament prophecies come to life. Jesus himself lived as the embodiment of the words he preached. He lived the gospel. He took all that God said in the Old Testament and with his life showed the world that the word of God was and still is true, faithful, and active. The second thing that's powerful is the actual scripture that he's reading here, right? He quotes Isaiah 61, which details the power of the kingdom of God here on earth. And this is what the power of the kingdom of God looks like here on earth. It says the spirit comes and gives power and guidance. And through that power and guidance, It activates people to bring good news to the poor, freedom for prisoners, sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Matthew, very simply in Matthew 9, calls it teaching, preaching, helping, and healing. And Jesus says, this scripture is about me. My time here. My ministry is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus lived in the power of the Spirit. And he brought hope, he brought peace, he brought healing, and he brought freedom to the broken world. The good news started with Jesus' actions. It started with Jesus' character. It started with him living the words and living the kingdom. And then what does he do? He calls us to follow him. Jesus calls us to live in the power of the Spirit. He calls us to have his character and to repent from our sins. He calls us to teach, to preach, to help, to heal. He calls us to live out the kingdom of God before we can spread the kingdom of God. And honestly, not even before. These two things can happen all at once. The greatest danger is for the spreading of the kingdom to be happening without the living of the kingdom. And I know it may seem like we talk about the vision and the mission a lot. I know it may seem like 
the rhythms can get repetitive, but there's a reason why we spend eight months of the year talking about drawing near to God and becoming more like Jesus because those two things are so deeply essential to this third aspect of spreading the kingdom. Because in order to spread the good news, church, we have to first be the good news. We have to live the kingdom. We have to live the scriptures. But I do understand, even as I preach this, I understand that this is a high calling. As I say words, as I'm, as I'm preaching this message, I, I, I think the fear that we can all have is, what if I'm not perfect? What's that line between being somebody who fails and being a hypocrite? And that brings me to the second thing about the good news that's so amazing. It's not just about doing what Jesus did, but it's also about being saved by Jesus ourselves. Go to Ephesians chapter two. We're gonna close out with this scripture. Ephesians chapter two, verse one. Paul says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, objects of wrath. But because of Jesus' great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here's the deal, church. For as long as we are on this side of eternity, we will be imperfect creatures that fall time and time again. But falling isn't the same as hypocrisy. And that's one of the most beautiful things about the gospel. And I'm going to give you just a small analogy just to, just to help you digest that. Think about what it means to be married. There is a difference between an imperfect husband and a husband who has broken his vows and has gone back out into the world to be a player. There's a huge difference between the two. And everybody knows that once you get married, there is no such thing as the perfect spouse. I realize every single day, I can, I can count the amount of times my wife rolls her eyes at my antics. Now look, I feel like I'm a fantastic spouse. Okay, but all spouses feel like they're the, the fantastic spouse. Uh, but according to how she responds to me, oftentimes, apparently, I may not be as fantastic as I like to fancy myself. <laughs> but the thing about that is, she knows that I'm not out in the world doing all kinds of nonsense. I may not be perfect. I may not do all my chores in time or I may not be the funniest person or I may scare her around corners when she asks me not to time and time again. But she knows completely and without the shadow of a doubt that I am absolutely committed to her. 
that's what makes a successful marriage. Not a perfect spouse, but a committed spouse. And it's the same with our relationship with God. God's love covers over a multitude of our sins and imperfections. God's grace has saved us. But you being a successful disciple, it's not about you being perfect. It's about you being committed to the grace that God gave you. So you want to ask yourself what the, what the line is between somebody who fails and somebody who's a hypocrite. A hypocrite is somebody who is not committed to Jesus, even though they say they are. A hypocrite is somebody who's, who does not make Jesus Lord in every aspect of their lives, who, who go out and they live in a way consistently that is the opposite of what Jesus calls them to live. Or even more than that, because that, that even becomes more about works. Somebody who's a hypocrite is somebody who consistently does not surrender to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He will give you the strength and the power to go do the things you need to do. But you first have to surrender to him. So my question to you this morning is not, are you perfect? Or are you doing all of these things all the time at 100% of your capacity? The question is, are you actually committed to Jesus being the Lord of your life? And if you're committed to Jesus being the Lord of your life, it means that in every single area, you're going to give your all to make sure that it's all in submission to him. In bringing the kingdom, Jesus makes us alive, church. Jesus frees us from sin and death and he fills our lives with grace and power. A grace and power that not only forgives us when we fall, but strengthens us to never have to choose those sins again. So this morning, I just want you to take a second. Think about what Jesus has saved you from. Really, take the time. Take this moment. Think about what Jesus has saved you from. Think about the sins that his spirit has overcome or is overcoming in your life. Think about the victory you've seen in your life through the power of the King. This is what it means, church, to be the good news. It means to do what Jesus did. Amen, we gotta do that. To live, but it also means to live every day in a victorious celebration of the fact that you were once dead in your sins but now Jesus has made you alive with him. This is what the evangelism of a true disciple begins with. The victory of the cross and the triumphant life that follows. Let's pray now for the bread and the cup. Father God, you call us to such an amazing destiny. And I personally love the adventure. I love the invitation. I love the mission. But for many of us and for me, when I'm having a bad day, it, it does not sound exciting. It can feel overwhelming. It can feel intimidating. But God, the most amazing thing is what you did on the cross. As we take the bread and the cup now that represents your broken body and your shed blood, God, I pray that we can remember the opportunity that you gave us. That you allowed yourself to be destroyed so that we each could be remade. So that we each could drink of the same spirit, God. And that spirit gives us life and godliness. And he guides us and he teaches us to become new creations. And I pray that we can carry the gratitude in our hearts every single day as we think about what you've rescued us from. 
to have wiped the sins out of our lives so that we do not have to bow down to them anymore, God. And you've given us the chance to bow only to you and your son and your authority, which is not oppressive, which is not heavy, but it gives us life. It gives us goodness. It gives us peace for eternity. Help us to always surrender to that peace. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.